Good morning, everyone. Oh, this, this mic makes me sound very important. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank you for being here with me. Um, thank you for the incredible team that put this conference together. It's so great to be together in person. Let's give them all a big round of applause, shall we? Yeah? They gave me what is described as an idiot-proof clicker, and I'm just the idiot to prove it. It's not a good joke. <laughs> so we are going to talk about failure today. My name is Dr. Matt Zakreski. Everybody calls me Dr. Matt. I'm a clinical psychologist, hops down, and apparently I'm an international speaker, still getting used to that. I am a grown-up gifted kid. I grew up as a gifted kid in New Jersey in the United States. And I said from a very early age, if I ever got the chance to work with kids, I wanted to work with kids like me. Because I remember how hard it was to be a gifted kid and how none of the adults in my life seemed to understand that. I got a lot of, but you're so smart. And, <laughs> and we're here to talk about failure today because failure is really important. It's important for us to understand as people, as professionals, and it's important for us to understand so we can help the people in our own lives. And I'm going to start with a very famous example of failure. So here's Jennifer Lawrence. She's just won the Oscar, and she falls down. Now, I thought about entering myself this way. I'm not that brave, because I would break my leg, and then this would be a much worse presentation. But imagine this for a second. You have reached the pinnacle of your career. You have won Best Actress. That's a big deal. And you are walking up in front of thousands of your colleagues and friends and millions of people watching on television, and you fall flat on your face. It's like tough to watch, right? <laughs> We're gonna come back to Jennifer in a minute, but this is a great example of what failure is. It is a lack of success or the inability to meet an expectation. In Jennifer's case, the expectation to walk up a small flight of stairs. I hope I meet your expectation today of giving a halfway decent keynote speech. But the idea here is that failure, even though it's a simple concept, can dominate our lives. It can make a lot of the decisions and feelings we have feel totally stuck, totally handcuffed by this idea of what happens if I fail. Failure, my friends, is inevitable. As this comic up here shows, it says, you're a perfectionist. No, I'm not. I just try to minimize errors. Down to zero, close to zero. Now I'll tell you a quick little story. I'm from New Jersey in the United States. You may remember the New Jersey from the TV show Jersey Shore, you know, the fist pumping. And that's an old reference. <laughs> um, but I used to work in a, a bar down on the Jersey Shore. And one night we were, we'd finish our shift, we we're loading the beer back into the refrigerators. And it's been a long day. I've been on my feet for 14 hours and I'm putting cases of beer back in the refrigerator. And I drop one. Shatter. And being a gifted kid and being very emotional as a general human being, I got very upset and started to melt down. And the guy I worked with said something that has always stuck with me, and I tell this story a lot. He said, okay, before you freak out, remember one thing. You've put away 10 cases of beer tonight, right? Yes. And you dropped one of them. Yes. So your failure rate is 1 over 10. I'm not a great math student, but I, I understand that math. That works for me. So tomorrow, try and do one out of 12. Then one out of 15. Now, I'm not comfortable wasting that much beer, but I, <laughs> I think you get where I'm going with this. One out of 20, one out of 50, one out of 100. You can never make the top number not one. The top number is always going to be one because failure can never be zero. It always exists, even if in a very, very small capacity. So all we can do as people is try and make the bottom number as big as we can. If you're failing one out of every two times right now, 
that's not good or bad. It's just where you're starting. Try to make that bottom number as big as you can. And we're going to talk a little bit about how to do that. So I'm a therapist. That's my primary job when I'm not traveling internationally. <laughs> and um, failure shows up a lot in therapy. Now, for gifted kids, therapy is a really nice place because you can't win at therapy. You can't get an A in therapy. Like this, card, like this tweet says, this is great. I'm going to get a good grade in therapy, which is something both normal and something that's regular to achieve. Not true. <laughs> for many of my gifted kids, they'll ask me, am I doing good in therapy? It's like, I'm just glad you're here. Therapy is a non-graded space, and that's really important because it's about being processing your emotions and being validated. It's a place to practice failing and practice recovering from failure. Now, the second part of that's really important because life gives us lots of opportunities to fail. You're going to fail a lot. I'm going to fail several times during this presentation. The idea here is to recover from failure, and therapy provides that safe space to do so. Now, there are a lot of approaches to therapy, and everybody thinks their therapy approach is the best. To me, it comes down to two important things. One, you change your relationship to your thoughts. And two, you increase the frequency, intensity, and duration of your feelings. How often it happens, how intense it is, and how long it lasts. So the goal of therapy isn't to not be anxious or not be depressed or not be angry. It's about to get those feelings to a manageable level. I'm only a little bit depressed. My anger did not last very long. Those are the goals we're looking for here. And one of the therapy approaches that I practice a lot that I find works really well with gifted and neurodiverse folks is something called acceptance and commitment therapy, or ACT. ACT was created by Stephen Hayes and his team at the University of Nevada in the United States. And the whole idea here is to develop and ex and expand psychological flexibility. The gifted population can be very co uh, cognitively rigid. We get very stuck on our ideas. And the idea here is that the more open we are, the more flexible and nimble we are, the more emotional range we have to respond to the world around us. Our successes, our failures, the weird stuff in between. If there's a lot of techniques we use, mindfulness, acceptance, et cetera, et cetera, but the whole idea here is to change the relationship you have to the thoughts you have. And we're going to practice that in just a moment. This is the primary model of acceptance and commitment therapy. It's called the Hexaflex. And it models the six things we're looking for here. Present focus, living with your values, having committed action, putting yourself in context, diffusing yourself from your thoughts, and accepting what happens to you. And you see in the text underneath it, those are the things we're trying to avoid. Being stuck in the past or the future, lack of direction, being inactive, seeing yourself as content, being fused to your thoughts, and avoiding your experiences. So if we're going to avoid our experiences, let's say, when I got very anxious about giving this talk about, oh, I don't know, an hour ago, I could have run to the airport, flown back to the United States, and you never would have seen me again. But I, I didn't do that. <laughs> I'm still here. Um, and the idea here, these are the things we're going to model, and we're going to walk through this step by step as we go. Click. Neat. So let's talk about acceptance. So what I'd like to do is have a volunteer from the audience. <laughs> I see people experientially avoiding. Let's see. Okay, yes, you the hand. Let's please give him a big round of applause. That will be explained in a second. Okay. Hi, and your name is? I'm Yarmo. Yarmo. So, we have our victim. I, I mean volunteer. <laughs> so, Yarmo, you look like a pretty strong young person. Thank you. 
yes. So, Yarmo, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to pick up that chair for me. Okay. And please hold it over your head. This is the power of being on stage, because people will do weird stuff like this just because you're up on stage. Now, right now, Yarmo is holding a chair above his head. That's kind of weird, right? I actually don't know what I'm doing. I just want to see how long he'll do this. I kid, my friend. <laughs> so the idea here is that we use something called the beach ball metaphor a lot when we're managing our feelings. Imagine trying to hold a beach ball underwater or a heavy chair above your head. Yarma, what does the chair want to do right now? It wants to go down. It wants to go down. And you're working really hard to hold it above your head, right? You're a very strong person. <laughs> Please make me stop this. <laughs> and if you hold the beach ball under the water, it wants to come up. Sooner or later, it's going to come up. And you get splashed, so you failed at your job, and now you're wet. That's not fun. If Yarmo isn't careful, his arms will give out, and that chair will land him in the head, and I will get sued, which I don't want to happen. So, Yarmo, how much longer do you think you could hold that chair? Do you, would you like to put it down? Yeah, okay, let's put it down. <laughs> Give him a big round of applause. Yeah. So, if that chair was a thought or a feeling you didn't like, you were working really hard to hold it above your head. Now, let's follow the metaphor. The, the chair, as the thought or feeling, it's still there, right? Can you still see it? Yes. Right. Are you working harder now or less hard than when you're holding it above your head? Less hard. Less hard. This is the idea of acceptance and commitment therapy. The thought is still there. The beach ball is still in the pool. But we're not working so hard to hold it up, hold it down, remove ourselves from it. When we do that, we accept that it's still going to exist, right? It's not, we didn't Thanos snap it out of existence. We're saying that it's over there now. And look, right now, you have the use of both of your hands again, right? <laughs> and you look a lot more relaxed than you did about 30 seconds ago. So I like this metaphor because it's a great way to say that it's not about getting rid of our thoughts. It's about changing the relationship we have to them. Let's give Yarmo a big round of applause. You did great, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. So the takeaways from this exercise is that failure is unavoidable. So stop trying to avoid it. When we embrace failure, the failure doesn't stop existing. The chair is still right there but it bothers us less because we're not working so hard. Failure triggers, un triggers uncomfortable feelings, something we call the struggle switch. So if I'm holding the beach ball in the water and it pops up, now I'm wet. So I'm mad that I failed. And now I'm upset at myself for getting mad. And now I'm anxious that I'm upset that I'm mad. And now I'm angry at myself for being anxious that I'm upset that I'm mad. And I could keep going, right? The struggle switch is when we have feelings on top of feelings on top of feelings for, for something that happened. This is the fastest way to having a meltdown because we're tacking a bunch of unpleasant feelings on top of each other. So the idea here is we gain our values back when letting things just be. The chair is still on the stage. If I'm not careful, I might stumble over it. But I accept that it's there. It's now in my head. I know if, as I wander around the stage, I need to be careful about where the chair is. But I can make different choices based on that as opposed to carrying the chair around with me the entire time. One of the things I like to say in therapy a lot is that it's about working smart, not hard. Right now I'm working smart. Yarmo before worked very hard to hold that chair above his head and he did a great job. But I would much rather work smart. So let's get into our second part of ACT, which is being present moment focused. When failure happens, it impacts us in several ways. It hurts our self-esteem. It hurts our self-worth. It hurts our ability to accept ourselves as we are. Because when we're stressed out, our body has a physical response to it. Our breathing increases. We get sweatier. We have more unpleasant thoughts. And all that stress pulls us from where we are right now to the past. 
Past failures make us depressed, and depressed almost, depression almost always pulls us to the past. Past failures, past events. I'm sure it's happened to you at some point or another that you're just walking around, and all of a sudden you get this very clear memory from a time that you did something very embarrassing when you were a kid. Seeing a lot of nods, <laughs> that's good. Because depression, depressed feelings always pull us right back to that moment. And because of that, we spend a lot of time in the future trying to fend off anxious feelings. Because failure, as we've learned from our past experiences, is a painful thing. We don't like that feeling. Our bodies work really hard not to be stressed out. When you're a gifted kid like me, like many of us in this room, you have lots of skills and techniques and strategies you can use to avoid failure. But in, while you avoid it, the fear of it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, which makes it harder and harder and harder to deal with it. We develop a deficit-based model. Instead of trying to win or overcome our challenges, we try not to lose. We try not to get hurt. We try not to put ourselves, jumping up, in a dangerous situation. And you can be very successful living that way. But it's not your best self because you're simultaneously being sucked to the past, because you're like, oh my gosh, I failed so epically the last time I tried this, and you get sucked to the future. If this happens again, I know I'll feel terrible, so I can't do that, I can't risk feeling terrible again. So you develop what we call hypervigilance. You're paying so much attention all the time to the possible threats that you are not here in the present moment. So everybody just do me one small favor. We're going to do a quick exercise about bringing our moment back to the present focus. So everybody take a deep breath in with me. And let's get really silent as a group. I've now just set the record for the most silence ever by an American. I'm very proud of this. It's not a good joke, but it's an easy one. But when you get silent, think about the things you can experience in this room when you're silent, when you bring your attention to this moment right now. I can feel the lights. I can hear the air conditioning machine. I can hear people fiddling in their chairs. Things sensory moments that were existing already that I was missing because I'm anxiously thinking, what's my next slide? What's my next slide? What's my next slide? When you bring yourself back to the moment, you're embracing the moment and everything in it. And that can be scary. But the more you practice it, the easier it becomes. General takeaway from this, the bad things that have happened to you have already happened to you. They're done. They're part of the story. Those words were written. Don't stumble over something behind you. If the last time you went for a promotion at work, you didn't get it, that happened. It's done. You can't change it. But there's no reason that means you shouldn't go for it again. We're going to talk about what to do with that failure in a minute. But I hope at this moment of this talk, you can say, hey, I shouldn't stumble from something behind me. It's already happened. If you keep carrying it with you, if you keep carrying that chair with you, it's going to keep hurting you. Do your best to leave it in the past, because that's where it belongs. The next thing we have is living our values. So why do neurodivergent people feel, or feel failure more? So we have this sense that we are gifted people. We are, I said, I'm a gifted kid. It's a, it's a term that I really believe in. And the idea here is that if I'm not gifted, if I don't have this special thing about me, then who am I? Well, I'm Dr. Matt. I'm a husband and a father and a friend and a godfather. I'm a lover of craft beer. I'm a lover of the MCU. I, very, I have an encyclopedic knowledge of The Simpsons, and I like, inter, I like international soccer. Those are things about me that are not my giftedness. Now, I bring my brain with me wherever I go. 
but there's so much more to me than that brain. Second thing is emotional intensity. Gifted people have really big feelings. Gifted people don't get mad, they get furious. <laughs> that was fun. I, I didn't practice sound effects, but I think that's where we're at right now. Oh, that's funny. My phone started doing a thing. Go away, phone. <laughs> Please put your phones in the locked position. <laughs> I told you I was going to fail, right? I just did it. I'm practicing what I preach. Um, <laughs> should I stumble over the chair or did, or did I make more? I think I'm good, yeah. So the way the gifted brain works is the emotional center of our brain, our amygdala, is more interconnected to the rest of our brain, which means when we have any feeling, it whips around our brain more. Third thing, experience of failure. When you're a gifted student, you do really well at a lot of things, which means you don't practice struggling. You don't practice failing. So when those things inevitably happen, because remember, failure is inevitable, you end up not having the same experience of dealing with this other people have. If you've lived in the country your whole life, and then you have to drive to Amsterdam for the first time, you've probably never dealt with city traffic before. See, they get that works. Traffic works as a metaphor no matter where you are. So you don't have as much experience dealing with it, so it's going to hit you harder. Gifted people also develop asynchronously. So you might have the ideas, the thinking process of a much older person, but you might only have the skills of a younger person. Imagine being eight years old and you have the idea for the next great novel in your brain, but you haven't learned how to type yet. Wouldn't that be really frustrating to have those thoughts and those visions in your head, but you can't get them out? It's a tricky thing. And last but not least, when you're gifted, you care. You care a lot. And a big part of my job as a therapist is getting people to make that caring work for them, not against them. When we do gifted education, it's not about following the rules. Gifted education is about how high can you fly. You'll never know how high you can jump until you jump. And if you risk jumping, you risk falling. It is unavoidable. But I won't know how high you can jump until you trust me enough to jump. And if you do that, I'll know how high you can go and what it's like for you when you land. And that enables me to craft an education program that fits you, that's going to serve your needs. It's about moving through what we already know to get what we don't know. Because when we get what we don't know, that's when we do our best learning. We call this the leading edge of learning. We have to know where we're starting to get to where we want to go. And it's about doing an assessment to figure out where that level is. We can't just guess. My colleague Jim Delisle, who's one of my most favorite humans, does an exercise where he has a bunch of smart adults, like in a room like this, do the alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I'm so proud of myself. And he has, it, has you do it again, and again, and again. And as you do it the third, fourth time, people start to get frustrated. They start to get angry. They start to get like fidgety in their chairs. I don't like this. Of course you don't. It's too easy. But then what happens to gifted kids in school is that the teacher says, oh, you know your maths? You know multiplication and division? Boom, here's some calculus. And the kid says, I don't know calculus. Oh, well, if you're so smart, you should figure it out because we whipped from too easy to too hard. And that's Angela Duckworth's work, that when things are too hard, we shut down. So the idea is taking the time to figure out where the need is. Um, another way to think about this is, all right. So I play the drums. I love the drums. I've been playing the drums most of my life. I'm not a great drummer. I'm an okay drummer. 
But if you were going to teach me how to play the drums, you wouldn't start with the basics. This is a cymbal, the big shiny metal thing, and you hit it, it goes I don't need to know that. I've, I've learned that part. But I also can't do the drum, the 16-minute drum solo from the Allman Brothers song, Blue Sky. I cannot do that. I've never done that before. So it's about figuring out where I am in my journey of learning that so you can teach me the stuff I need to know. That's, that's what gifted education is all about. And when we do this, when we make that assessment, it enables us to build failure into the learning process. Because here's the thing. If you're doing your job, you're going to fail more often. For who, in, who in this room plays video games? Usually a pretty safe bet at a gifted conference. Wow, you guys play video games? No way. If you're playing a video game and the characters get harder and the music gets faster, you're going the right direction, right? Failure's baked in. As we get better, we're going to fail more often which feels paradoxical, but it's because your things are getting harder as you get better. When things get harder, you're gonna fail more often. But you forget how much you've leveled up during that process. I'm a theater kid. Shocking, I know. And we always say in the theater, the show must go on. That's a value, that's a lived value. So if this PowerPoint went out right now, or we lost power, anything short of me fainting, and I really hope I don't faint, I will find a way to keep doing this because the show must go on. And the show must go on. That's a value in the theater space because a live performance of anything has never gone the way we thought it would. Sometimes your phone starts playing random YouTube videos in your pocket. Sometimes a fire alarm goes off. Things happen, but the show must go on. That's a lived value. And one of the best examples of things in the theater space is William Shakespeare. And in his play, The Tragedy of Julius Caesar, Brutus says, peace, count the clock. And Cassius says, the clock, clock hath struck it three. So this is William Shakespeare. Does anybody know what's wrong with this passage? Give yourselves a big round of applause. You figured it out. Yes, there were no clocks in the age of Julius Caesar. So if William Shakespeare can make a mistake, I think we're going to be okay, you guys. The show must go on. Next thing we have is our committed action. To do that, I'm going to ask for three volunteers, three volunteers from the audience. Okay, in the back, in the middle there, I see one hand, two, three. All right, come on up. Give them a big round of applause, you guys. Oh, that is a very cool hat. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So... You I know, and your name is? Marco. Marco. Lovely to meet you. And? Safina. Safina. Okay, so we're gonna play a quick game. You guys have taken a committed action. You committed to something by coming up here on stage and being my next victim, volunteer, sorry. We're gonna play a game called Zoot. Have you ever heard of this game before? No. So the way that this game works is I know the rules of the game, they don't. Fun, right? We're going to count as high as we can. At some point in this game, you're going to say the, the word zoot instead of saying a number. But I'm not going to tell you what number to say it in front of. So I'll start. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Zoot. Wrong. Good guess, though. <laughs> Wrong! Wrong. <laughs> That's how it feels in our head, right? We're normalizing failure. We're all in this together. Okay, start us over at one. One, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. <laughs> <laughs> what comes after five? Does it have to be in order? It does have to be in order. 
But that's a good question, I never said that. So after, yeah, there you go. Such a gifted kid way to solve that problem. So after five comes? There you go. Wrong. So we just got a second piece of information. We know seven comes after six. So if I said you're wrong, what do you think that means? Maybe, or maybe you need to replace the words. There we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, zoot. Good. Nine, 12, 13, 14. wrong. We just got our second piece of information, though. So you, you, can, you can hear them all buzzing. They're like, oh, I think we figured it out. Easy to figure it out when you're sitting down there, guys. Okay, let's do it one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six, zoot, zoot, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, zoot, fifteen, sixteen, zoot. Wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Whose game is this? <laughs> so I just gave them a third piece of information. Can you guess what number comes next? The cloud is saying 18. You want to take a guess? 19? It was 18. Oh, it was 18. Yeah. 19? 20. What comes next? <laughs> Very good. Hey, you guys can go back to your seats. Give them a big round of applause, you guys. So the idea there is Zoot is a game that I play in therapy with my clients all the time because it's a game you cannot play without failing. There is no way to know the rules of Zoot until you play it and mess up. Unless you like already knew, right? But that's cheating. So the idea there is that so many things in life we learn through failure. We learn by trying and failing. But our brain tends to forget that stuff. It tends to forget the things we've learned through failure. So it treats every future failure as this big catastrophic thing. But our three volunteers just did a wonderful job failing in front of hundreds of people. And they did a great job. So give them one more round of applause. <laughs> failure is an event. It is not your personality. When we personalize failure, we increase its impact on us. And our brains try to make sense of the world. They do that by centering ourselves in our narratives. What the young people say, we have main character energy. Young people, did I get that right? Oh, I got a, I got a thumbs up. I'm so cool. <laughs> Not true. <laughs> but we can never see all the external factors that contribute to our failure. Last year, I had the opportunity to go back and give a talk at my high school. Uh, where I graduated from the United States, and halfway through my talk, there was a code blue lockdown at school. That could mean lots of things. It could have mean that there was a shooter. It could have meant the school was on fire. It could have meant that there was a medical emergency. In this case, there was a medical emergency. But awfully hard to get my audience back after the giant blue alarm went off and we all had to shelter in place. And I left that school and I was so bummed out I said to my wife, I was like, I screwed up that talk. It wasn't very good. And she looked at me. She said, what happened during your talk? I was like, well, there was a code blue. We had to shelter in place. That's a context. It doesn't let me off the hook. I could have done better in this talk like I could have done better at any talk. But awfully hard to overcome something like a giant alarm going off halfway through your talk. Context always matters. And when you're gifted, and you've centered yourself in your own story, as someone who's always successful and always figures it out and always learns, it's very easy to forget that. So I'm here to remind you. Self as context, not content. Because if you are a smart person, and smart people always know things and always do well at things, the content of that self is not a person who fails or messes up. And I hereby, as a psychologist, release you of that. Everybody messes up. Raise your hand if you have messed up today. Raise your hand if you have failed today. Raise your hand if you have failed this week. 
Raise your hand if you failed this month, this year. Raise your hand if you failed in the last five minutes. <laughs> exactly. But think about the responses to that. Everybody was raising your hands. So in this room of several hundred people of your colleagues and experts from all over the world, people are raising their hands. They're smiling. If you failed, all I can tell you is that you're in good company. So are you a novice? Have you never done this before? Have you never played the game Zoot before? Ambiguity. Were the directions clear? Um, my friend right there. Hi. Um, this is one of my good friends. Um, would you do me a favor? Would you stand up, please? So I've asked her to stand up. Now I'm going to ask you to sit down. Very difficult task, I know. Now, she sat in her chair. Why did you sit in a chair? Did I ask you to sit in a chair, or did I ask you to... I told you to sit down. I didn't say sit down in a chair. The directions were ambiguous. Now, it was implied I meant chair. Her chair is right there, and I'm not going to make you sit on the ground. But that's an ambiguous direction. If I had it in my head that you had to sit on the floor, you would have failed at that task, not because you're not smart or capable, but because I didn't explain it properly. Ambiguity can lead to failure, but we tend to blame ourselves for that, not the, the idiot giving the directions. Thank you. <laughs> Perfectionism. Who in this room is a perfectionist? Ah, uh, my people. Uh, good can be the enemy of great, but great is often the enemy of done. I had a kid that I work with back in the United States. He had an assignment for school to write a four-page paper on Benjamin Franklin. Great American statesman, an interesting person to write a paper on. My client decided, instead of writing a four-page paper, to build a life-size model of Ben Franklin out of Legos. Not a scale model. Ben Franklin was 1.8 meters tall and about 150 kilograms. Don't ask me what those things mean. I looked it up on the internet. So he failed the, the task because he set himself too high of a goal. And he didn't say anything, so the teacher was like, where's your paper? He goes, I'm building a life-size model out of Legos. And everybody went. <laughs> Nothing wrong place. Are you trying to see it in the wrong environment for you? When a flower doesn't grow, we don't blame the flower. We change the garden. You might just not be in the right place for you. Systemic bias. There are things baked into organizations and systems that raise some people up and lower other people. We cannot change those things, but by becoming aware of them, we start to dismantle them. I often say, who's more privileged than me? I'm a straight, cisgender, heterosexual, white male with a doctorate. I mean, like, I am captain privilege. But I use that privilege to open doors for other people. I can't fix systemic bias, but I can do what I can to stop it. And for the gifted and neurodiverse population, the standards we are trying to meet are often not our own. I have a kid I work with who almost failed grade five, not because she's not an excellent writer, artist, mathematician, scientist, or historian, but because she couldn't catch a softball. Sports are important. Physical exercise is a good thing. But I care zero that that kid cannot catch a softball. It's not worth holding her back a grade. But we had to have multiple meetings and fight with the school to keep her in the grade six because the standards she was being held to are not her own. Let your failures refine you, not define you. We are always in context, not content. Stages of failure. We have a fa failure of vision. I don't even know where I want to go. This is existential depression. It's not fun, but it's super common in the gifted population. Failure of tactics. I know what I want, but I don't know how to get there. If you were sitting out there in the audience right now thinking, someday I want to give a keynote, and you don't know how to get from where you are to where I am, find me while you're here. Because I'll get you there. 
Failure strategy. I have a plan. I followed it, but I haven't achieved my goal. For anyone who's ever tried to lose weight, I'm working out, but nothing's happening. Maybe you need to change your strategy. Or, and this is the biggest, a big thing in the gifted population, failure of adherence. I had a plan. It worked. I did a thing, but I couldn't stick with it. You may need to tweak your plan to make it easier to stick with. But each one of these failures gives us information. When each of these things happen, we know more than we did before. Even knowing that you don't know is progress. And it's hard to think of it that way. But I promise you it's true. So let's diffuse ourselves from our thoughts. Thinking styles that maintain failure. Black and white thinking. It's either perfect or I failed. Not true. I think that's only true if you're like a brain surgeon. <laughs> All or nothing thinking. Part of this thing event didn't go well, so therefore I failed. I have not been perfect at this, but I feel like it's going okay so far. A self-fulfilling prophecy. I knew it. I knew I was going to fail. So I set myself up to fail by not trying very hard. Self-justification. I, I, I think that I was going to fail. So I'm going to keep looking and asking for information that proves me right. Do you think I did okay at this? Yeah, you did fine. But I mean, I think I screwed up. You didn't screw up. But I'm pretty sure I did. No, no, you didn't. Really, I think I messed up. Fine, you messed up. I knew it. <laughs> and catastrophizing. Assuming that all failures are equally terrible, catastrophic, and will ruin your day. So... Can I borrow you for a second? Yes. Okay. Let's give her a big round of applause. And your name is? Yvonne. Yvonne. All right, Yvonne, I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. This is my wallet. I'm, I don't make a lot of money, so I don't mind giving this to her. I'm going to toss this to you, okay? She caught it. Give her a big round of applause. Now, Yvonne, would you throw it back to me? Hey. Right in the face. <laughs> now, I just made a mistake. Is everybody okay? Am I okay? Yvonne, are you okay? So not every mistake is equally important, right? Get, you can, here, I'll help you down. Give her a big round of applause. It's funny because it's a failure within a failure. I actually brought a banana from breakfast that I was going to do this with, and I left it in my hotel room. <laughs> Sometimes you roll with the punches. So a way to change your thinking style. This is a little thing, but it's a great test to take with you. So we're all going to do a little exercise together. Everybody, I want you to think of a giraffe. Think of a giraffe in your brain right now. Everyone's thinking about a giraffe. Make that giraffe purple. We now have a purple giraffe. Now, I'm super colorblind, so I don't know if your giraffes are actually purple, but what I imagine purple to be. Now that you have your purple giraffe in your head, I want you to put that giraffe in some sort of vehicle. Car, scooter, hot air balloon, stealth bomber. One of those like weird motorized bikes they have here. When you've got your giraffe in that, give me a thumbs up. So I have my purple giraffe riding a bicycle. You can see that clearly in your head. You can see your purple giraffe on your vehicle somewhere in your brain. Do me a favor, look around this room. Anybody see any purple giraffes? If you do, please tell me I am a psychologist. <laughs> but you can see it, and you can see it clearly, but it doesn't make it real. So if you visualize yourself messing up, if you visualize yourself not getting that date, not getting that promotion, failing that test, it's not real. Just because we think it doesn't make it true. We have to live it. That's when it becomes true. What we're going to do here is we're going to model what we call bottom-up thinking. Every step we take towards a goal gets us closer to a goal. But if you think top-down, the first thing you see is a mistake. 
If you're a gifted kid and you get a 95 out of 100 on a test, if you're doing top-down thinking, the first thing you're going to see is, I got one wrong. Right? All the gifted girls are like, yeah, totally. <laughs> you idiot. Bottom-up thinking is, I got 95% of this right. It's pretty cool. I took a really difficult test when I was in undergrad, when I was at university. Um, it was a test all about the law of free speech in the United States. And I worked really, really hard on my final exam, and I got it back, and I got a 72. And I was livid, because I'm a gifted kid, and I get really mad. And I went up to the professor. I said, Professor, I, I, I worked so hard on this. How did I get a 72? He's like, you did great. No, I didn't. I'm a gifted kid. 72 is no. He goes, Matt, it's a 72 out of 75. <laughs> Wish I had had that information before. But I was doing top-down thinking. The first thing I saw is how much I screwed up. Once I got the new context, I was able to switch to bottom-up thinking. So regardless of what, who you are or what you're trying to do, don't think about it as, my goal is here, and if I'm not at my goal, I have failed. Think about it, whatever steps you take towards it is progress. I did this, um, I did this, uh, I talked about this for uh, the Alabama Gifted Association in the United States, and a gentleman raised his hand, he said, so, so you're saying that I should take a ladder and hang it in my classroom to remind students to climb the ladder towards their goal. And I said, sir, if you want to, I, that's a great idea to do it, yeah. Three days later, I get an email from him, he's literally hung a ladder in his classroom. But that's not a bad thing to do. I have this picture in my office, and I'll point to it and say, are you doing top-down or bottom-up thinking right now? Bottom-up thinking makes space for failure. And since failure is unavoidable, it's a good way to think. Failure doesn't happen to you. It happens for you. We all learn from our mistakes. We increase our experience in failure through trial and error, and if we handle failure correctly, it will increase our motivation. Um, is, have you ever been to a carnival? And they carnival, they have those carnival games, and you're supposed to throw like the little ring onto the bottle, and you can't do it. It seems so easy. And you're like, I should spend more money on this, so I'm going to do more of it. And it increases your motivation, and I'm going to keep doing. Failure can increase our motivation. If you really want it, failure can light a fire in us. That's good. Leaning into that feeling is what we're trying to do. And failure can push back against our perfectionism. And that might feel really bad at first, but then look around and remind yourself, the world hasn't ended. You thought it was going to be perfect, and it wasn't because few things are. But that doesn't mean it wasn't good. And the parts that didn't work, you can learn from. The event still happened, but how we think about it changes. There's a wonderful quote from Amanda Gorman here. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed something that isn't broken. It's simply unfinished. Not a single person in this room is a finished product. Whether you are in the team conference, or, you have, or you're giving the keynote, for God's sakes, or you're at the end of your career, none of us are finished. Which means failure is not only possible, it's guaranteed. But as we keep going and as we keep failing, we become more finished. And that's a beautiful thing. So the idea here is we're going to model psychological flexibility. Our thoughts are not our thoughts. They're just information. And when we see them and we can accept them as they are, you notice the chair is still on the stage? Who forgot about the chair? That's act in action, guys. Because it's been there the whole time. I'm not a magician. They're like, woo! But we forgot about it because we started doing things we cared about. We started living our values and having committed action and staying present moment focused because that's what we're here to do. But if that chair is our thoughts, our fears, our depression, our anxiety, our rage, it's been there the whole time. But when we accept it as true, it goes away. 
Lots of famous failures here. Steven Spielberg, rejected from film school. Jerry Steinfeld, as a stand-up comic, people tell the story all the time. First time he ever got up on stage, he went, uh, bananas, true story, he said bananas, and then he ran off stage. <laughs> Jerry Steinfeld has la made literally a billion dollars as a stand-up comic. I think he turned out okay. Elvis Presley was told that he had no charisma. Oh, thank you very much. Vera Wang was cut from Olympic figure skating and then passed over for Vogue editor. And did she end up okay? I mean, I think so. Walt Disney was fired from a newspaper for lacking imagination. <laughs> Michael Jordan was cut from his basketball team. Sochiro Honda, his factories were destroyed not once but twice. Oprah Winfrey was fired from her job as a reporter. Winston Churchill lost five elections. And probably my favorite example of failure Chocolate chip cookies. Who enjoys a chocolate chip cookie? You have Ruth Wakefield and her famous failure to thank. Great quote from Winston Churchill about, think, about failure. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. If you leave this conference, but especially this keynote with nothing else, I hope you have the courage to continue. There are only three ways to truly fail. To never try, to give up, or to stop improving. We are all capable of doing all three of these things. Of trying, of keeping going, and improving. I hope you do that. Failure is not a bad thing. We can reframe it. Failure, as I like to say, is frequent attempts in learning. It also means frustrated, angry, insecure. Lean into those feelings. Or finally, investigating looks, other ways of approaching a problem. Put this in your classroom and remind your kids that fail is not the end of the story. It's a pause. It's an opportunity to reframe. So. In order to move forward from failure, we have to learn to sit with that feeling. Who's seen Inside Out? It's a great movie, I cry every time. And when Bing Bong loses his, his wagon over the edge, Joy's like, let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep going, let's keep moving, let's keep moving. And Bing Bong can't move forward because he's mourning the loss of his wagon. It isn't until sadness sits with him and sits with that feeling of failure that he can get up and move on. One of the things that we do as parents, educators, mental health professionals, caring people, is we move, try to move people through their feeling very quickly. And sometimes we have to sit with it. Okay, so uh, let's say, where are my dads? Where are my dads in the audience? Dads, can you raise your hands for me? Very few dads at these conferences. <laughs> So, and all parents are guilty of this, but it's almost always the dad. So dads, I'm going to speak directly to you. At some point in your life, your children will fail at something. They won't make the team. They won't get the part in the play. They'll fail the test. And you're going to go full dad with it and be like, well, son, if you had practiced harder, you would have made the team. That's probably true, but that's not the moment to tell that story. Sit with the feeling. The lessons will come later. But if your kid staggers through the front door weeping because they didn't make the field hockey team, that's not the one. To, I told you so. That's obnoxious, right? It's like, hey, give me a hug. We're going to handle this together. We sit with the feeling. So, having gone through this in Lots of detail. Let me tell you a story about my most epic failure. The year is 2007, and I have been invited to the American Association of Editorial Cartoonists in Washington, D.C. One of the other jobs I've had has been a professional cartoonist. And the 40 best college cartoonists were all invited to this conference. So from all the colleges in the United States, and there are thousands of them, they picked 40 of us. And there ended up being 41 people at this conference, and that 41st person is going to be very important. 
So part of the workshop was we had our work judged by a very famous cartoonist. In my case, the great Annette Balstieri. She has won two Pulitzer Prizes. She's a big deal. And I sat there, and I was wearing my suit, and I laid out all my cartoons, and I said, Anne, I would be really interested in your thoughts on my work. And Anne looked through them, and I will never forget this. She looked up over her notes. She pushed her glasses up her nose, and she said, you're bad at this. <laughs> I, I'm sorry? You're, you're not very good at this. How did they pick you for this conference? Actually, that was the same thought I had when Desiree called me to do this. <laughs> me? Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry, Anne. I, I, I don't understand. She's like, well, th this work is, it's not very well drawn. It doesn't have clear ideas. I don't agree with your politics. You get to that place where you're trying really hard not to cry. I'm like, just nodding very quickly. And she said, okay, well, I'm going to grade this, and you'll get this when you're done. And I went and I cried, cried in the bathroom for a little while. And I left, and I had my, my packet done. And on the top, it had my ranking. Out of the 40 cartoonists that were invited to this conference, I finished 41st. They had added somebody else at the last minute, and I finished in last, last place. And I was really sad about that. I love cartooning, and it hurt. And I took my packet, and I left. I was supposed to sit on a panel. I bailed. I got on a train. I went back home. And I was sitting there with my parents and sobbing at the kitchen table. And then my mom, who was looking through the packet, said, when you're ready, now here's the key part, when you're ready, I've got something for you. It took me a couple of days. But I finally said, Mom, I'm ready. What was the thing you wanted to say? And there was a single line Anne put, Annette put, in the bottom of her, her report shows promise in not being an editorial cartoonist, should consider comic books. That led indirectly to the launch of my webcomic, My Roommate's a Superhero, which ran for two years. I became a comic book artist. And that comic led directly to my graphic novel that comes out next year. And I can't tell you I would be here up on this stage doing this without that fail. I certainly would not be making a graphic novel. But if you had tried to tell me that in 2007, when I had just been shredded by one of the giants in my field, I, I couldn't have heard it. I wouldn't have heard it. I failed. I had to sit with that feeling. And it felt like the world was ending. I thought, the sun will never shine again. I will never feel happiness. This is the end of my dreams. But sometimes the end of something puts you on a path to find something else. Because right now I'm here in this beautiful city with you beautiful people. And we are all helping each other. We're lifting each other up. And I would not be here right now without that. So I say thank you to Annette. I say thank you to failure. Because you may not know where you're going with it. But you always get where you're meant to be. And that's a really wonderful thing. Lots of lessons from failure, staying authentically humble. Life will knock you on your butt. That's okay. Think strategically about your choices, what comes next. Embrace the idea of change. Gather people who you can trust. 
There's a reason I took a train home and sat with my mom and dad, my two closest advisors. Learn to seek and accept feedback. Don't surround yourself with a bunch of yes men who are like, you're great. That's one of the problems gifted kids have. It's hard to get authentic feedback. You're wonderful. You're such a great artist, writer, dancer, mathematician. Find someone who's going to say, and then you need to learn this. And thinking about the other resources you need and want. I had spent a lot of time and energy trying to be an editorial cartoonist. I couldn't move right from that into being a comic book artist. So I read some books, and I found a mentor. And I worked, and I practiced. And then I did a webcomic. And then, many years later, I wrote a book. You have to find the resources to get you from where you are to where you want to be. That's bottom-up thinking. I'm not where I want to be, but I know how to get there. So this all comes to my life philosophy. If you already don't have what you want, you might as well try. Because if you try and fail, nothing has changed. I had not done an international keynote until I did. I had not written a book until I did. I had the opportunity to be on stage for the 25th annual Putnam County Spelling Bee, which is a musical, and they were pilling people from the audience, and I thought it would be really cool to be on a Broadway stage. So I raised my hand, and I auditioned, and I got to be in the show. Because if I hadn't raised my hand, I was already not going to be on a Broadway stage. That was definitely a thing that was going to happen. But by raising my hand, I gave myself a chance. And then the thing I really wanted happened. And it's a beautiful thing. So what happens to Jennifer Lawrence? Because everybody remembers that she fell. She went up and she accepted her Best Actress Oscar and she gave a beautiful speech. And the thing is, the first thing she said in her speech was, you guys are just clapping for me because I fell. She didn't run from it. She didn't run from her failure. She embraced it. She owned it. And thus, it became part of her story, not the whole story. The chair is still on stage, but I haven't thought about it, and that's okay. Lots of other resources about this. I, you know, when we upload this, I want you guys to be able to do some more reading and two really wonderful videos about acceptance and commitment therapy, ways to broaden your own education, your own way of wrapping your heads around failure. There we go. So, that's that. So, you guys were an absolutely incredible audience. Here's how you get in touch with me. Please give yourselves a big round of applause and go out there and fail greatly. Yeah.